Need a sealant to help shield your home from the elements? Introducing Tight Shield, your weatherproof shield against the elements. One of Tight Bond's newest sealant products, Tight Shield fills gaps up to two inches while remaining flexible. It adheres to almost any material and expands and contracts up to 50% of joint size. Plus, it comes in a variety of colors and is paintable. Check out Tight Shield and the rest of Tight Bond's sealant line at tightbond.com. Again, the first question is, can we refrigerate? The second is, okay, now that we've created these, how do we make sure that they're working well for our environment and sustainable for our environment? Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by producer Nate Gruca. Hi there. And experts from Train American, St- Train American Standard, uh, first, technical trainer Eric Weiss. Hello. And portfolio leader for Ducted Split Outdoor Products, Christy Pedoto. Hi there. Please email your questions to FHB Podcast at finehomebuilding.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Christy, Eric, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate your being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, we were introduced because I got a, uh, an email uh, that suggested uh, you all were willing to talk about uh, a switch over to the new refrigerants that will affect folks who have air conditioning systems and heat pumps, I presume. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But Eric, can you first uh, tell us what you do for Train American Standard? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a um, technical trainer. So my background is that of a technician. I spent more years in attics and crawl spaces and installing and maintenance and serving and also a, uh, a contractor in Phoenix, Arizona. So my background is working on systems. And luckily, probably about 15 years ago, able to join the American Standard team from a factory support representative and working with the engineering teams in Tyler, Texas, to develop training material to help our techs in the field to better understand the products to provide better service and overall better system performance for our homeowners. Interesting. Uh, Christy, what do you do for Train American Standard? Yeah, so my role is a portfolio leader for our ducted split outdoor products and probably thinking, okay, but what is that? So really, I work to understand our, understand our industry. So that's where it is and then where it's headed. And then I work with our teams to partner to figure out how do we continue to improve our products so that we can meet the needs of the future. Um, I've been with American Standard for about 15 years now. My background is predominantly in the engineering side of the business and kind of explored and got more into the business facing side in the past five years. Hmm. So uh, HVAC is a huge topic. We're going to talk about the industry and refrigerants today. Uh, let's start off with uh, why we were introduced. And can someone, uh, w- can one of you please explain what's going on with the switchover from the current refrigerant? What is it for starters? And what are we moving to and why? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so when we think about what's ahead of us in 2025, so as of January 1st, 2025, Um, The EPA is requiring through a technology transition rule that as an industry, we produce and sell products that use a refrigerants with lower global warming potential. Now, the first question would be, okay, where did this come from, right? So we'll back up a little bit in history. And really, this is coming from our commitment to the Montreal Protocol and then the Kingali Amendment. So when we think about that, there were two aspects that we're facing today. Um, One of them is looking at the phase down of some refrigerants. So this has to do with our R410A that's predominantly used in industry today. And then the other is to change the technology so that we're using those lower global warming potential refrigerants. Um, So the change is coming, like I said, it's gonna be January 1st of 2025. It's from a manufacturing standpoint. So uh, American Standard as an equipment manufacturer will start producing products that use those lower global warming potential refrigerants. Um, What it does allow for us to do though is sell products through. So anything manufactured prior to that January 1st, 2025 date can be sold through and installed. It's a change on the manufacturing side of things. Hmm. So uh, the first refrigerant I remember were CFCs, uh, chlorofluorocarbons. And then I believe we had 
uh, HFCs, and I forget what the H stands for. Can you all or one of you run through uh, why uh, we've had to switch refrigerants in the past? And are, are the changes that we're making now for the same reasons or are they uh, were uh is the GWP potential of a refrigerant the same reasons we switched in the past? Yeah, so I'll take that one as well. So when we think about refrigeration, refrigeration has been around for an incredibly long time, right? So let's think back to the mid 1800s is when we first started seeing refrigeration. And the first pass that it was really thinking about how do we make it work, right? So the first thing was let's find a fluid, let's find something that will help us uh, create heating or cooling solutions, right? Um, then it came into a next generation of, of refrigerant or products, right? These chemicals that said, how do we make sure that they're safe and stable, right? We wanna make sure that things are working well. Um, it wasn't until around 1990, right? So as I mentioned, the Montreal Protocol, which started to bring in this new factor of environmental stability, right? Or sustainability efforts. The first pass of the protocol is what brought in the 1990s, the first change that we think about. So what you mentioned earlier, where we went from R22 to R410A. And that really focused on eliminating ozone depleting chemicals, right? So that's what drove that particular industry change. As I mentioned, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol around 2016 is when that went into place, is what's driving us to this next change. Now, both are related to environmental sustainability, right, making sure that Again, the first question is, can we refrigerate? The second is, okay, now that we've created these, how do we make sure that they're working well for our environment and sustainable for our environment? So the Kingali Agreement really points to that global warming potential. And so that's why in 2025, we'll be moving to refrigerants that have a lower global warming potential. This is a little bit different than the ozone depleting, right, that we talked about before with the 410A. This conversion really focuses on that warming potential. Um. There are, uh, as I understand it, plenty of trade-offs when you're choosing a refrigerant. Uh, some are flammable. Uh, some, you know, you mentioned have an environmental impact we don't want. Uh, some that work at higher pressures than others, which make it more challenging. I think you'd agree, Eric, for the technician. Um, the new generation of refrigerants, first, what are they called, like by number or general category? And, and what are some of the things that are going to be more challenging for techs or for the equipment? Yeah, so when we thought about these new refrigerants to go to, and I say we as an industry, right, looking at what was next, um, there are three main categories. I'll say there's hundreds of things to look at when you think about what makes a good refrigerant. The three main categories are going to be safety, efficiency, and then, of course, because of the protocols, the impact to the environment, right? So those are the three main considerations. Other considerations are going to be things like chemical stability. Hey, how does it interact with materials, right, that you might use in the construction and use of it? the capacity, what lubricants you can use with that refrigerant. So a lot of things come into play when you consider that. So with this latest requirement, so looking at lowering that global warming potential, um, a lot of hours and a lot of dollars were spent to figure out what's the next best alternative, right? And that is what has led us to a classification of refrigerants known as A2Ls, right? So A2L is an ASHRAE safety classification right? The A stands for a level of toxicity, A being non-toxic. There would be a category B that would be toxic, right? And then the number numerical value has to do with the level of flammability. So an A1, as an example, would be non-toxic and non-flammable. That is the category which R410A, the commonly used refrigerant, falls into today. In order, the trade-off that you talked about, to reach that lower global warming potential, the new refrigerants fall in a category we call A2L. So A, again, is non-toxic. Category two is slightly more uh, um, prone to flammability. And then the L is actually a, a discrete class of that, which is a lower limit. So these are hard to ignite materials, um, but there is a level, a slight increase in flammability compared to the A1 or non-flammable refrigerants. That's probably one of the major trade-offs, right? When we think about uh, how do we get to that lower global warming potential requirement. Hmm. Uh, one of my colleagues asked me today in preparation uh, uh, of our conversation, he said, uh, well, we need new line sets to uh, use these new refrigerants for topping off existing equipment. And my my response was, you're probably going to need new equipment. Was I was I correct in that uh, assessment or can you can you retrofit 
current equipment with the new refrigerants? So I'll take the first part of that and then I'm going to hand it to Eric for the line set question. When we talk about the equipment itself, right, the equipment itself, because of the safety standards um, that are required for that level of refrigerant, they do have to be new pieces of equipment. So in order to handle an A2L, right, it has to meet the safety standards for handling that A2L equipment. So there is a change in the equipment itself. There are also slightly different properties of this refrigerant compared to R410, right? So the design of the equipment is gonna change minorly when we think about the way the valves are configured or set for this refrigerant versus 410A. From a line set standpoint, I'll hand it over to Eric. He can talk a little bit about those. Okay, thanks, Christy. Um, most of the line sets, if they need to be reused, probably can be reused. And it's probably not a best field practice, especially if the old system has, you know, mechanical failures, such as a, a failure to the compressor. So there can be contaminants, there can be, you know, crud, if you will, acidic conditions within the line set that can dramatically reduce the life of the new system. So it would be a best practice to be able to run new line sets on every installation. Unfortunately, that's not the real world that we live in. So the practices that we follow today, if there is a concern about contamination in the line set, they may use some sort of a, a flushing agent like uh, R11 flush, and there's different brands out there. And those work. It is a solvent and it does a pretty good job of cleaning up the line sets and continue with that same practice. Now, with the new refrigerants, when we're talking A2Ls, there's going to be two dominant refrigerants on the market. It's not just one. Uh, there's going to be 454B, which is what we use, and there's going to be R32. So there'll be two different types of refrigerants, all depending on the manufacturer of the system. Now, the challenge with line sets is the velocity rates. With 454B, it's about 10% slower than 410A. So we no longer have the velocity which means maintaining oil return is a little bit more of a challenge. We move to R32, the velocity drops even further. And we're probably about 20% slower than we are with 410A. So again, oil return, the velocity of the refrigerant moving through the vapor lines, coming back into the compressor needs to be fast enough to keep that oil in motion. So we are gonna tend to see smaller refrigerant lines with this refrigerant transition than we have with 410A. From our literature, we will tell our dealers saying, this particular system, this tonnage for this length and lift, here are your refrigerant line options. And the majority of the time, what we use for 410A can be used for our 454B systems. But it's absolutely critical that the person selling the job evaluates the line sizes per the system they're installing to make sure that they're gonna work okay. Oh, I love the caveat at the end, Eric. That was fantastic. Uh, so uh, three eighths and five eighths will be uh, still the norm. Is that fair to say for residential systems? On smaller tonnages, typically, yeah, that would work. Now you're going to find a lot of five sixteenths. Five sixteenths is going to be the dominant liquid line, and I think you're going to see that across all manufacturers. The goal: minimize refrigerant charge when possible, and that's one avenue to do so. But if three eighths is existing, it's okay to use it in most applications and again always follow through with the exact product you're installing to confirm christy uh i'm guessing that the uh, oil return issues that eric was talking about are part of why you need different equipment is that right is that only one of the reasons that you would need to swap the equipment yeah, and like I mentioned before, one of the biggest things and the biggest reasons is the safety protocols. So in order to incorporate an A2L, um, there is safety mitigation that's going to be required. So there is detection or refrigerant detection systems is what we'll be deploying in American Standard products to make sure that we recognize if there is a leak and take the proper mitigation actions. So in order to comply, right, from a safety standard perspective, we need to make sure that equipment is ready and capable of supporting the safety systems. Are we looking at similar uh, system capacities versus uh, the uh, 410A systems? Uh, are they going to be about the same for tonnage uh, comparison? Yeah, and when you think about it, you know, the way that I like to think about it, the refrigerant may change, right? But we're changing the designs to meet that refrigerant. So when we think about nominal capacity, when we think about the performance targets that we're going to look to make sure that we're giving the right um, efficiencies and everything, the designs will conform to the refrigerant, right, in order to meet those requirements. So, yes, uh, capacities, you know, that you see today, you're going to see those in the new refrigerants as well. I'm kind of uh, just 
springing this on you both, but um, if someone had the choice between replacing a system now with the current uh, family of refrigerants or waiting before this new uh, family of refrigerants, what would you do? I'll take that one. I, I think it's a hard call, right? Um, it's going to be a personal decision for folks. There are some trade-offs that they might consider, right? So one might be, as I mentioned before, when we look at this transition, it not only includes the change in the manufactured equipment technology, it also includes a phase down of the 410A refrigerant production and import into the United States, right? So for that reason, if you guys think back, when we saw this transition from R22 to 410A, if you remember that price of refrigerant started to creep up. Right. So the reason for that is the same rationale. They started to phase down the production and availability in the U.S. So we all know as supply goes down and demand stays the same, price is going to go up. So there is a, you know, there's a, a risk, I'll say potential that you might consider to say, hey, if I've got a service, if I've got to do refrigerant work in the future, it may be a little bit more expensive than it is today. So that may be something to consider. Right. But as I mentioned, there are a little bit different. People might be a little unsure of this hard to ignite refrigerant. Um, and if they want to stick with the 410A, that's perfectly acceptable too. So um, just a trade-off that they need to be thinking through. Um, always when you're considering purchasing a new system, there are things that you're going to take into consideration, like the upfront cost of the system versus what the efficiency and comfort improvements you're going to feel along the way with the new system. Hmm. Eric, anything you'd add? No, I agree 100%. And, you know, for me personally, I have no preference what refrigerant is in my house, but supply and demand could be a risk with 410A, as you noted with the 22 transition that we went through. Uh, we'll talk about, about it a little bit, but um, what about tech, techs? What, what, what are they going to have to do differently with regard to serving, servicing systems and installing them with the new refrigerants? Yeah, there's a lot of changes from that aspect. Now, through my training, one thing I do believe that technicians that follow best practices today with the refrigeration systems have a very easy transition to the new refrigerant. For me, if I'm working on a 410A system or 454B system, the pressures are so similar that I don't think I would be able to tell which refrigerant I'm working with until I get up and actually look at the data plate. So very similar performance characteristics between 410A and uh, 454B. 32, a little bit different. Um, maybe some higher head pressures on that, higher temperatures, uh, especially on the compressor discharge. Um, but there are a lot of regulations in place with this new refrigerant. So we have to make sure that the line sets do not have any refrigerant leaks. So we're gonna be asking for higher nitrogen pressure tests. So for me installing the system, once I'm ready to go and I want to test for leaks on braze joints or flare fittings or, you know, pipe press, compression, whatever you're using out there, um, I need to hit it with significant pressures. And I've seen the numbers vary a little bit from one manufacturer to another. And that pressure needs to hold for a full hour. So when I'm pressurizing the line set, I need to find something else to do with my job. Maybe it's time to go wire up the thermostat or find something to do for that time. Once we have confirmed that the pressure holds, now we need to pull a deep vacuum on the system, the evacuation process. You know, before it was always a good policy. Every manufacturer's literature I see has requirements for that. And now it's going to be an industry required standard. So make sure that we can pull a deep vacuum on the system, dry it out. And that also helps to confirm that there are no leaks in the system. So additional steps is to make sure we have a solid line of non-leaking tubing between the indoor and the outdoor unit. And that helps confirm that we should have minimal leaks in the future. One of the biggest challenges for the builders out there, there are new codes that are going to be coming into place through the ASHRAE standards for the refrigerant lines between the indoor and the outdoor units. So part of the new build that we start running, um, you know, through the wall penetrations, we start going over trusses, we can no longer just rest the refrigerant lines on the tubing, which we have done in the past. Everything has to be properly plated and has to be properly sealed to make sure there are no risks of any sort of an abrasion point that could cause a leak in the future. So that's gonna come into the uh, building mechanical codes. Uh, ASHRAE uh, 15.2 is a good standard to look at. And that ASHRAE 15.2 document will provide a lot of information about how line sets must be run especially in multifamily where we start running line sets between floors of multiple living conditions. 
They have to be fire rated and there are a lot of restrictions in those arenas. Uh, I'm guessing that's because of the, uh, you, you all have been very careful to not call it low flammability, I think is how you describe it. Is it because of the refrigerant are more flammable? Yes. Yes. They've taken extreme precautions on the safety side with the new refrigerant. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, changing gears here a little bit, uh, a lot of our conversation on the fine home building podcast relates to the state of the HVAC industry. And, uh, we uh, consistently hear from our listeners about systems that are oversized, poor ductwork, leaky ductwork. I'm sure you all have heard the complaints too. Um, what do you think about these complaints that seem so regular uh, and the seemingly uh, insurmountable problem of oversizing equipment? Uh, Eric, do you want to go first? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we see it all too often. And you know, through a lot of the training that I've done, we've reached out and, you know, received some feedback and probably 50 to 75% of the contractors out there now feel it's a good practice. If the house has a three ton, let's go ahead and put in a three and a half ton. Uh, looking at some notes that I had, just kind of calculating the, uh, the static pressure. So if I had a house that originally, oh, get my lights back on in the room, that originally had a, a three ton system running about six tenths of an inch of static, and I decide to upsize that to a three and a half ton. Well, now my static pressure is about 0.9 inches, you know, maybe 0.85 ballpark, which means my blower watts go up significantly. My system duty cycles a lot. My velocity through the air filter increases. So my indoor air quality now drops. Uh, a lot of negative impacts of doing that. And if another contractor comes back behind, you know, that original upsize and says, well, we'll bump you up another half a ton. Well, now I'm up at about 1.2 inches and we see premature motor failures and we see flooding and premature failures of the compressor and all these degradations to system performance. Very few contractors in the retrofit world are taking the time to do a heat load calculation to really understand the needs of the home and the homeowner. Because if it's an older house, chances are they've upgraded windows, they've added some insulation, maybe some weatherization, and they probably took that three ton system down to a two and a half ton. In which case, uh, we could probably drop a static closer to half an inch, quiet operation, long run cycles, dehumidification, improved indoor air quality, everything the homeowner is asking for. Just have to take the time to find out what the house really needs. And that's a big miss in our world. How do we get them to do better, Eric? <sighs> he sighs. <laughs> you know, training, I think, is a big key. So everything that I try to do pushes along those lines. And we have some incredible dealers out there that, that know heating and air conditioning and the application just beautifully to be able to deliver the ultimate and comfort systems. Unfortunately, most contractors out there uh, you know, try to be as quick and move as fast as they possibly can and they do not take the time to do it well. The only places where I have seen success is where states start to mandate this with their codes. If you want to install a new system and get a permit, you need to turn the heat load calculation and system sizing performance to us. Now, does it mean it's accurate? No, but at least it means that somebody had to put forth some effort and hopefully if they're putting forth the effort, they're doing some diligence to do it right. Uh, Christy, this one's for you. So I think one of the things that HVAC techs would say is the, uh, you know, equipment is way more complicated. Uh, the controls are way more complicated. It makes it more difficult for us to do our jobs. How, how would you respond to an HVAC tech who said that to you? Um, I would say, think about the car industry, right? Think about the cars. In order to be more efficient and more effective, right? It takes technology. It takes innovation, and we're gonna keep getting better. We're gonna keep becoming more efficient. This is what we need to do to support our customers, right? Um, what we can do is just because that technology is in there doesn't mean it has to be complicated. So don't be intimidated, right? Um, it is available to you. We are thinking of ways, how do you service this? How do you maintain it? Um, that is in mind. So just because it's inherent, just because it has that new technology, don't assume that it's complicated, right? There are ways that we can work to make that simpler for the technician. Eric, I don't know if there's anything you would add. You do a lot of training in this space. No, I mean, you're spot on. And even the more complex we make the systems, part of our design and engineering process is to make it easier for them. 
So we've taken a lot of the difficult configurations out of the technician's hands that are often missed, and we actually put those into the algorithm development within the system itself. For the system, um, the link system that we have, our high-end variable speed system, you cannot even set an airflow CFM per ton because the algorithms that we have, and they're smart enough to say, hey, it's humid in the house. I need to run in a certain condition with lower airflow and higher compressor speed, or, hey, the house is dry, we're comfortable, and we can actually flop and run higher airflow, lower compressor speed to really maximize the efficiency of the system. So we're in so incredibly dynamic as we get into high performance machines to maximize comfort and maximize humidity, all depending on the current state of that home. It's really, really cool. The technology is impressive and I've covered it for fine home building, variable speed and uh, multiple stage equipment. Um, one of the things that I think folks would complain about with that equipment is the parts are harder to get. And especially with the supply chain disruptions that occurred during uh, COVID lockdown, uh, boy, you know, generic parts that you could buy from any supply house were sure appealing. Uh, once again, what would you guys say to the techs who are scared of the technology because they might not be able to get parts or circuit boards, whatever? Yeah, I mean, that's a risk and a risk with uh, everything, even when you get into furnaces, you know, base furnaces, it tends to have a, a specific, you know, integrated furnace control board. There are some generic stuff on the market, but not ideal. So absolutely, the more complicated it gets, the concern of uh, parts availability specific to that unit, you know, increase. A uh, very simple base unit that I've worked on in the field from 30 years ago. Yeah, I could go to any place and tear that thing apart and retrofit it in any way I wanted and make it work. Uh, those days are starting to move behind us, especially now with the transition to A2Ls, because now we do have specific refrigeration detection systems where the sensor and the control board are integrated to work as one. And mix matching between one product and another is not going to work for you. And that applies to all manufacturers. So the trend that is a concern, you're going to see more and more after the future. You know, one thing I've observed in my career is that there's been some consolidation in the HVAC equipment uh, business, and uh, it's uh, a, a highly competitive business. Is it difficult to make money selling HVAC equipment? Christy, you want this one? I guess I can take this one, yeah. So when you think about HVAC equipment, I would say, in your perspective, when you say making money, I'm thinking from a dealer's perspective, right? And I think the really cool thing about the HVAC space is that you bring so much value to the table. So no, right? Because the value that we described earlier, those fantastic dealers that are doing those heat load calculations and serving their customers with some great comfort and efficient solutions are bringing incredible amount of value to the table. Um, there's absolutely profit in what you're doing and bringing that value and placing and applying equipment correctly. So what should builders who are, you know, the majority of our audience listening to this show be telling their clients about uh, clients about what type of equipment or what features you should have or what should they be advising them to, to get? It may depend on where they're located, right? So climate, I, I think your, your little slip there is, is absolutely a part of it, right? So where is it being installed? And then the application, right? where is it being applied to? So Eric mentioned earlier, right, you've got multifamily construction where it may have a different solution approach than if you have a single family home, as an example. Um, when you think about it, you know, we like to think about a couple of things. One is certainly the efficiency of the equipment. So what are you looking for as far as efficient and cost of operation? So it's not just that initial, but what is it going to look like running over time? And then the comfort, right? How is it going to be comfort for the folks that are going to occupy that space as a home? right? Um, Eric kind of pointed to a couple of those lenses. When we think about comfort, we can think about humidity control. So making sure that it's not too damp or wet in that climate, right? In the indoor environment, um, we can think about indoor air quality control, right? So the comfort of the air that you're going to breathe in that space. And then what people often think of when they think of heating and cooling, just the temperature, right? Uh, hot or cold and how that fits in the space. So when you're talking about uh, entry-level equipment, mid-tier equipment, high-end equipment, can you talk about the differences that you're paying for uh, and what features you're getting when you're getting on the higher end of the spectrum? Yeah. So when we think about it, I think Eric was talking primarily, we've got the entry level space. So this is where, you know, you're going to meet minimum requirements from a regulation standpoint for efficiency. Now recognize that even today, we recently had a minimum efficiency change. 
So the minimum equipment today is probably going to be better than something that was installed 10 years ago. Is it still so 80%, right uh, Christy? Sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Say that again. Is it still 80% that used to be the minimum or until, re you know, uh, even now? Yeah. So uh, performance efficiencies are going to change based on refrigerant bearing systems, right? Which are going to be today we talk about CR2, HSPF2, EER2. Some of those are a little bit uh, uh, tied to the climate zone or to the geography in which you sit. So they're going to be varying a little different for an air conditioner, maybe than a heat pump. Heat pumps obviously are going to have the HSPF requirements. 80% you may be referring to AFUE, which is a performance characteristic for a gas furnace. Right. So those are going to vary depend on the on the product. But, yep, you're going to have that efficiency standard. Again, we saw HSPF2, CR2 and ER2 introduced in 2023, and that was a step up in the minimum efficiency. So even if you're installing something that's minimum efficiency today, but you're replacing something that was installed 10 years ago, you're going to get a more efficient system. So I don't want people to think, hey, I'm doing minimum efficiency. This is the no, it's it could be very much an improvement upon the, the equipment that's currently installed. When you start getting into the mid-tier, like I said, you start to think about a couple things. You start to think about comfort and then a little bit more efficiency. So no, you're no longer at those minimum efficiencies. You're going to take a step up from there. Um, in some cases, this mid-tier is going to get you to points where we may see incentives within the market. So maybe you qualify for the $2,000 up to $2,000 tax credit that you see for heat pumps or the $600 or credit for AC or furnace, right, in the mid-tier space, um, you're going to get a little bit more comfort. So you might see things like two stages. You might see things like variable speed indoor fans, right? Um, you might see some of those comfort levels begin to step up. In the premium space, right, so in that high tier space, we're going to talk a little bit more around true variable speed and true comfort, right? So you're going to take that comfort and then you're going to rank it up that much more. So even more humidity control, even more stability in the temperature set points. Um, and then you're going to see even greater efficiency from a performance standpoint. So you're going to step that up even higher. So this is where you're going to start to see those 20 plus CR2 type units or, you know, 97% and above AFUE furnace. Maybe more than uh, most uh, home systems, folks pay attention to warranties on HVAC equipment. Uh, are there longer warranties on the higher tier stuff versus the low end equipment? In general, we stand behind the reliability of our products. So when you think about warranty, um, that system is going to have a great warranty, whether it's an entry-level product or a high-end product. What do you think about uh, what Christy was saying, Eric, with regard to uh, performance characteristics or installation characteristics or features uh, in the low, middle, and high-tier equipment? Are there things that uh, technicians would uh, pay attention to more than other folks who would just have to turn a thermostat? Yes, a lot of it ties into the installation and configuration and commissioning. So when you think about an entry level system, there's not much you can do. It is pretty much 100% relay, you know, the, the installation quality is really on the contractor. Do I have the right airflow? Do I have everything set? Because once the thermostat says, give me cooler and give me heating, it's going to run at one speed. There's nothing there. You get into the mid-tier and you get into variable speed indoor blower motors and intelligent thermostats. Uh, we have what we call an 824 control that can actually talk directly to the blower motor. So now if it is humid in the space, the control can say, I'm uncomfortable, homeowner's uncomfortable, let's reduce the airflow. And it completely changes the dynamics of how the refrigeration system works to dehumidify. And even though it's a single stage outdoor unit, now we have some fan control. And then we take it one step further to that uh, platinum, that high end, where we can now manipulate compressor speed alongside blower speed pretty much independently of each other to maximize efficiency and comfort in any perspective. It is the ultimate in, uh, in comfort system. You know, I, I keep telling people, if you came to my house and said, hey, I'll put this single stage 15 sear in for you and take your variable speed and pay 100% of your energy bills, I'm not taking the trade. I, I'd love for them to pay my energy bills. I promise you I would. But I am so comfortable with that fully variable speed system that we have because of our uh, intelligent algorithms that we build into it. There's no way I'm taking that trade. There's no way I'm giving up my comfort. Uh, it's, it's the ultimate in what I want in my house. Eric, one of the things that uh, folks uh, challenge us on the podcast about is that we tell folks not to put duct work in unconditioned spaces. Uh, 
I'm sure you'd tell folks the same thing. The folks who live in the southern half of the U.S., though, say we don't have anywhere else to put ductwork excepting in the attic. Um, what what do you do? Do you just do as best you can and keep it in the attic or do you build chases? Uh, what do we do? Yeah, I wouldn't go to the point of building chases, but if it is in non-conditioned spaces, whether it's attic or crawl, right? Crawl is going to be cooler, but it's also going to have an incredible amount of moisture. So sealing the ducts is most important. That is step one. And if we have access and we are concerned about the performance, overall performance of the system, then let's try to get, uh, you know, R8 in there. Let's rip out that old R4.2 duct and let's run some new ducting and make sure it's sealed in the process. And if we can seal it and if we can increase the uh, duct insulation, then the dynamics of the, the penalty are, are greatly diminished. We've probably taken, you know, a poor duct system might increase the load on the system by 25, 30%. And we can probably take that back down to maybe around 5% or 7%, where the penalty is now going to be fairly, uh, fairly small. But again, it goes back into the quality of the material, the higher insulation, uh, and also being in the Southern Territory, that will also help minimize duct condensate or duct sweat. And sealing up the duct systems greatly reduces the infiltration of the home, which is gonna make the home more efficient. Um, I think you'd agree that uh, technicians and HVAC companies are unlikely to uh, do pressure testing uh, unless they are required to demonstrate a certain degree of tightness. Um, not every place has these tightness uh, requirements. Even the places that do, uh, enforcement is very hit or miss, I think you'd agree. What can a builder or remodeler do to incentivize or require or make their HVAC techs do a good job running duct work and sealing it correctly? Well, probably one of the drawbacks if we get into testing means the cost of the house just went up. We now have another contractor that needs to come in and the original contractor doing the work has to be more thorough, more time labor intensive uh, to do it correctly. So step one, the builder is going to have to pay more for the house to be done properly, which is sometimes a hard sell. I'd probably rather take that and put it into a granite countertop or different lighting. Um, so I fear until we do implement uh, some sort of a mandate, some qualification that says you need to pass this uh, duct pressurization test on every home that's built, we may not see that trend unless if we have a builder that says this is important to me and I'm going to promote this as part of my sale of my buildings, that we do meet this uh, duct performance criteria. You would have to be an enhancement for the sale. Yeah, do you have any experience with uh... Do can builders uh, advertise the fact that their heating and cooling systems are going to keep you more comfortable or cost you less money? Have you have we seen evidence in the marketplace that might steer this in the right direction? I have not seen that, but I think about it more and more all the time. If I was a builder, I think I would try to find a way to promote the comfort of the system rather than just that yellow hang tag sear rating. What do we do differently that's going to make you happier in this home that you're not going to find with another builder? and figure out what that edge is and try to promote it as this is important. You may be aware of Proctor Engineering and some of the DOE tests for field adjusted sear rating. And a lot of this goes back into the you know 1990s ballpark, which are the systems being replaced today. And they found on average and going across the country that most systems are probably have about a 40% average energy waste. And so the homeowner is paying 40% more for their heating and cooling bills than they should be. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the equipment. It has everything to do with the install commissioning process. That's unfortunate. Yeah, because you got so close. <laughs> then it all falls apart. What do you think about this, Chris? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, and, and I would agree, right? So when I think about it, you know, you're not just selling a house, you're selling a home, right? So when you think about what's the value, what's the comfort, um, you know, you see a lot of smart integration and things like that that you're starting to see in, in builds, right? So where does that comfort and security, right? How does that fit into the equation? And how do you make that part of the value of the home that you're creating? So thinking about how to pull in these elements and, and to Eric's point, right? You go so far in picking some great equipment, right? For your build, making sure that it's applied correctly is so important, taking that last step, right? 
Eric, do you have one of those uh, mo- mo- uh, motion sensor light that time- times out? Yeah, it lets me take a nap when nobody's looking. <laughs> <laughs> so our old office building used to have those. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I've been there. Uh, good for you for tolerating that. I would have that thing disconnected in 10 minutes. But <laughs> uh, a lot of our folks who might be listening might be considering a switch to a heat pump. Uh, from gas or oil, uh, like is common in the Northeast and Midwest. Um, I have some, uh, I've been contemplating this myself. I have some reservations because I worry about a couple things. One is the price of electricity, which seems to go up with such regularity. And the other is technicians who are capable of servicing a high performance cold weather heat pump. Uh, so do you all think, uh, my, uh, concerns are founded and if not uh what should folks know about making the switch yeah so i'll start with that and then i'll I'll turn it over to eric here so when we think about the idea of you know changing heating sources right from gas or oil to electric right driving our refrigeration system um, i think there's a lot of momentum in this space so one thing you might consider is what incentives are out there and available so in some cases and in some areas we're going to find that there are incentives that are going to make it very cost efficient upfront right they're going to kind of help with that Um, when it comes to longevity of it i would say how long are you going to have that system so as you continue to watch your electric rates as you continue to watch your oil bill or your gas bill right what do you think and and what are you looking at that's going to be for the next 10 years right where do we really think that that's headed that should be part of your decision we know that they're going to weigh they're going to change but you know you listen to the news you know there's a lot of activity in this space right there's a lot of investment happening in this space um, and i really do think that's something to consider when you're thinking about such a big and a long-term investment um, when we think about the technology itself right heat pumps the idea of a heat pump this has been around for a very long time right but just like when we were talking about the refrigerants earlier this technology continues to evolve so when you think about those lower ambient operating or cold climate heat pumps this is not the same heat pump that you remember from the 1980s, right? This is a brand new set of heat pumps. I recognize, again, maybe some of the concerns, hey, this is a technology I'm not as familiar with, or perhaps your technician's not as familiar with, Um, but so much has gone into the design. And the same thing we were talking about before, which is how do we make that equipment, even though, right, it has this technology, it has this innovation to keep it serviceable and keep it workable for technicians. So I really do think that the opportunities out there, I think it's something to consider um, and looking at what's available to you locally is going to make most sense for you. So again, there's some incentives and things that may drive it more in your area versus others. Eric, anything you'd add around thinking about electric versus gas solutions? No, I mean, me personally, I'm a huge fan of dual fuel. You know, when we launched variable speed outdoors over a year ago, really strong heat pump heating performance. And we put it in the homes for field trials right before we ever went to market. We sent this out to our factory support representatives across the country and put it in. And to be honest with you, I was surprised where they said, I like my heat pump better than my furnace. Because now we have that modulation capacity where we're delivering very consistent air with our products, about a you know, 33, 34 degree temperature rise, regardless of the ambient temperature. And we get the long run cycles, quiet operation, no longer on and off on that furnace, and we maintain a more comfortable house. Now, if the conditions do get to the point where we need more capacity, then we have the dual fuel. And even some of the FSR feedbacks, we have um, gas companies coming out, evaluating meters, changing gas meters, because they can't believe what happened to the house. Um, Heading up into Ohio, a couple of years ago, one of the FSRs, said they dropped their uh, cubic feet rate from 52 CCF to five CCF. So, you know, just a huge drop in gas consumption, having that dual fuel system. Uh, So it's really the best of both worlds. Eric, why go with a heat pump and a gas furnace versus a a conventional air conditioner and a gas furnace? I'm guessing it would be significantly less money. to be honest with you, I don't know where that would fall in, especially when you get into specifically the cold climate type heat pumps. Uh, so yeah, adding a furnace may be a little bit more costly. Uh, Patrick, you and I are probably in agreement that it would be really nice to have multiple fuel options within a house for heat. 
Um, you know, whether it's going to be a stove or a furnace or a heat pump, whatever the case may be, especially in cold climates. So for me, that gives me also some peace of mind, right, on top of everything else. But the cold climate technology today that's improving, uh, heat pumps are going to do a pretty decent job of maintaining indoor temperature. Now, there is application challenges there as well. I mean, even the ductless system. We talked about duct systems being an issue. But if we get into ductless systems, we also have line sets to consider. And long runs of refrigerant line sets through very cold, non-conditioned spaces can have a tremendous negative penalty hit to the ductless type products where we have three or four different indoor units and 60, 70 feet of line sets running outside at five degrees in temperature. So now we got this refrigerant that leaves our unit at 160 degrees running through three eighths insulation on that refrigerant line for 150 feet and our capacity and our efficiency and our system performance really has degradation. So no matter what product's being installed, application is key. Uh, there's been some complaints in the, uh, especially the high performance building industry that American equipment has not kept pace with uh, the Japanese and Korean manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers now too, with regard to making a uh, high performance uh, mini or, uh, multi-split or ducted mini-split technology. Do you think we're catching up? Are we getting there? Um, do we have products that work in temperatures as low as uh, Mitsubishi or one of the other manufacturers? So um, when we think about what's out there on the market, right? I, like I said, I think this is an evolving technology. We have seen it, I'll say more so in this ductless space where you're seeing um, you know, single zone or multi-zone mini-splits. Um, I do think that that technology is only on the cusp. So if we think about there's a DOE cold climate heat pump challenge, I will say the majority of all American OEMs are participating in that. Mm. This is not dominated by, I'll say, the Asian manufacturers in that zone. So um, maybe you're not seeing it predominantly. I don't think we had as much incentive out there, but we're starting to see a lot of incentives, right, come to play for this type of technology and this type of solution. And it is driving activity in this space. So. It is absolutely part of the, the roadmap. It's absolutely something that's coming, and there's evidence out there of it. Chrissy, do you want to tell us uh, anything else that you see on the horizon with regard to HVAC technology? I think, you know, we've seen it coming a long way. So we've talked about earlier, you know, the progression of, of changes in refrigerant, but we see it too in the innovation, the technology, and you start to see that more at this high end space. So the things that Eric has talked about, highlighted in our, you know, our platinum, our premium product, you really start to see that continue to dive into, I'll say the more mainstream. So when you think about the trends out there, we're seeing a lot more digital engagement. Um, so how do we make sure that we're connecting to those systems? We know more about how they're operating. How are we getting smarter with our algorithms or our controls to drive comfort for customers? And behind that is a whole ton of technology, right? That says, okay, in order to do that, how are we going to solve that problem? So that's where you see a little bit more, right, in the electronics that you start to see in equipment, also within um, variable speed or multi-speed type technologies, whether that be in compression or in fans. So definitely seeing this industry, it may not be rocketing out, um, but a lot of progress in this industry, at least in the 15 years that I've been here. And I know there's a lot more to come. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is indoor air, air quality seems to have become a much bigger thing since the COVID-19 outbreak, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. I think you'd agree that uh, we haven't taken advantage of the capabilities with HVAC systems in homes to help purify our air. Do you see that getting better too? Yeah, I do think there's a lot more interest, right? There's a lot more, again, when we think about it, it's not just that hang tag on the unit that tells us the performance from an energy efficiency standpoint, we're seeing a lot more interest in the quality of the comfort. So that quality could be the air quality, a lot more in filtration, ventilation, right? We talked about a little bit dehumidification. So whether that's done with the equipment or a secondary piece, um, this is all very important as we think about the comfort of the home and the comfort of the people in the, that environment. What do you think, Eric? No, I, I agree absolutely as well. And, you know, it's even one of the challenges when we talked about, you know, the Asian market, if you will, or the ductless, the multi-head kind of strategy uh, versus a ducted system, which is more common for what we would manufacture, uh, you know, all manufacturers across the states. 
so even from a ductive perspective, when you start adding accessories like high performance filters, uh, you can certainly do that with ductive products much more so than you can with a, a ductless head. Um, if I'm in cold climate, I need to add a humidifier. Well, how do we do that? We can put one in the airstream very easily. Uh, very tough to do with a, a true ductless system. Now with ductless, we can have ducted indoors as well as high static ducted indoors, but then your efficiency performance also tends to drop significantly with those products. You know, the high 20 plus SEER ratings all of a sudden drop significantly, but we're able to add comfort accessories to make the homeowner improvements with indoor air quality, as well as humidification and other aspects like that. So for the, the contractor, the builder, it's really challenging to find out what is gonna be the best system for that homeowner as far as electrification, comfort, and overall system efficiency. Do you have any advice on how folks can uh, better educate themselves on what equipment they should be suggesting to their clients? Or systems, I guess I should say more accurately. Typically what I see a lot of it's on the structure of the house. So if we are high end custom homes, you know, then I see high end custom products going in. I was just doing a training in Dallas on system zoning. I was talking to a dealer and they say, we have a high end market. We only work in this one residence and all we sell is variable speed systems with modulating furnaces. But you know, the low end home in there is probably $5 million. Not all contractors get that niche market. Uh, so if I'm in multifamily, then my choices are going to be very different. And it is a tough strategy to determine where do I want to price my house? What is my dollar per square foot and what's going to be important to my customers? And how do I market that to them? So there's no real easy solution in my book for it, but other than the market and what you're trying to push. And Christy, you may have more on that. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, when we think about the HVAC system of the home, right? It's another system in the home. So hopefully it meets the qualification that you're searching for. So if we're doing that high end, we're taking into consideration what type of equipment we're putting in um, to meet that high end customer's need, right? Uh, we're looking at what are we looking at from a, a value of that whole home and how does our HVAC system help meet that um, requirement? So I do think there's a, a piece of it that says, just make sure that the selection that we do for HVAC fits the intent. Well, it has been a pleasure talking to you both. And I hope our listeners who have uh, further questions uh, will write to the podcast email box and uh, I'll forward them along and you guys would weigh in, I hope. Let's see what we can do. All right. Um, is there anything you want to ask or tell our listeners before we go today, Eric or Christy? I think the only thing I'd leave us with is, you know, we talked a lot today about the upcoming refrigerant change. If you want to learn more, this is brought to us by the EPA. So check out epa.org or .gov. Um, make sure that, I mean, that's your resource. Go to the source, right, would be my first recommendation. Um, and we've talked about a lot of great products. So if you're interested in American Standard, please check out AmericanStandardAir.com. If you want to see what we have to say about refrigerants, just do a quick search for GWP, and you'll find more information about the refrigerants and our perspective. What do you think, Eric? No, I agree. One of the other challenges with the new refrigerant transition is through this next year and probably through 2025, you're probably going to see a lot of or some conflicting information between different manufacturers and even how UL underwriter laboratories is kind of rolling out. So if you think about a home build, once that home is done, you have an inspector come out. Whatever city that's going to be in, someone's coming out with a code and a rule book and they're going to say, okay, that, you know, this needs to be done. And the builder is hoping for inspector A and not inspector B. And that kind of happens on the national level as well. So you're probably going to find some different manufacturers that had inspector A and other manufacturers that had inspector B. And we're not all quite on the exact same line as far as what the UL requirements are going to be. So anticipate, you know, whatever manufacturer is being used out there that you may see some differences and you may see some changes as we roll into this new A2L refrigerants over the next two year for requirements. I can guess that manufacturers have some uh, guidance on changes uh, as far as installation requirements forthcoming. And uh, I would always remind folks, you need to go to the individual specific who made the equipment, right? You can't, it's not a pick and choose, right? You have to do what they tell you. There's no rule of thumb out there. Absolutely right. Yeah, agreed. Go to the source. Always go to the source. 
Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thanks to Christy, Eric, and Nate for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. I hope you'll send us your follow-up questions for Christy and Eric, and we'll pass those along for their answers. Uh, send those and your other building-related questions and feedback and suggestions to fhbpodcast at finehomebuilding.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. That helps other folks find the podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Check out those new refrigerants. They're going to be big.